Well, today's one of those days when the uh, normal pattern of ministry in Llandilo is disrupted. We've had uh, freezing weather and dangerous roads and uh, didn't therefore meet this morning at my celebrating. And uh, the ministry comes to you on, on the web today. We meet online and on the ground, but today I'm afraid we simply, simply meet online. So um, what are we looking at today in terms of looking at scripture together? I, um, <clears throat> I spent last evening before the, the freezing weather came in uh, at the 50th birthday party of a good friend with some uh, reasonably non-church people and we gathered around and, and made the best of his, uh, his big day for him. It was good to do. And uh, there was a room, I guess, of 60 or 80 people in uh, an upstairs function room at one of the, one of the local taverns, as it were. No secret who I am, and 60 or 80 people in the room, I, I knew and was known to some degree or another by most of them. We're a small town, and that's that's great. It's it's wonderful. Now, not many Christians in the room with us. Uh, that seemed to be quite good for the bar trade. And um, maybe a, a, an hour or two in, it became apparent I was amongst people who were upright and decent people from the town. Decent enough people hoping, it seemed, to sustain a bit of a a peekaboo relationship with God. That's that's not not meant to be a disparaging remark in the least, but it, it just seemed a little bit like the way we used to relate to Doctor Who when we were kids. I was um, particularly struck by a, a new friend that I'd made. Uh, I knew of him, didn't know him until last night, and on our way to the car park he was suddenly quite forthright about what he sees as the godlessness of our society. And I hadn't expected that. It caught me a little bit by surprise after our conversations all evening. Now, as I say, none of this is meant to be disparaging of anybody at all. It shouldn't be taken that way. Because I think I know how it comes about. I think I, I can see some very decent people in the same sort of boat in Scripture, where people want to see godliness, want to see holiness at work in society and from God, but at arm's length. As it were like the children peering round the edge of the sofa at Doctor Who, fascinated, riveted, but happier if it's over there, at a safe distance, away from me. Holiness. Let me spell out what I mean. Many people, it seems to me, find that their problem with God um, crops up with, with being sinful people who lack confidence in the benevolence of a loving but holy God. Just pause there a minute. What do I mean by holy? Obvious big question. When the Bible uses the word holy, when it calls God holy, it means that he is transcendentally separate from us. Now that word transcendent, its, it's it derivative components mean to climb across, but, but what it means is exceeding the usual limits, over and above. To transcend is to go above and beyond a certain limit. So when we talk about the transcendence of God, we're talking about the extent to which he is fundamentally over and above us. In his character, in his nature, in his potential and so on. And when the Bible talks about God being holy, it means that he is set apart from us in a transcendent sort of way. He is transcendentally separate, so far above us and beyond us, that he seems, this is the important bit, he seems almost totally foreign to us. Now just beware of this for a minute. Purity is contained within that transcendental separateness of God. Not exhausted by it. Purity is included within it. But that's not all there is to it at all. Of course God is pure and holy. But holiness is bigger than just purity. It's that he's separate and transcendent and above us in a complete, in a much bigger way. To be holy is to be other, to be different in a singularly special sort of way. And of course, as human beings... We fear the closeness of that transcendent foreignness. We fear God because he's holy. We're attracted to righteousness. We're attracted to a powerful, mighty God who, who could be for us. But we want to keep him at a safe distance because we're not sure he's completely safe.
God is too great for us. He's too awesome. We don't want, as it were, the supernatural coming that close. He's too great, he's too awesome, he makes, we fear, he makes difficult demands of us. He's the, the mysterious stranger who threatens our security. And the prospect of being confronted by him face to face, personally, may actually be our greatest trauma. It was Bertrand Russell who said his biggest fear was not that death was the end, but that it might not be. So there's a sense then by this, the holiness of God in which we are at the same time attracted to it and repulsed by it, like the child with Doctor Who. Something draws us to what's good and right and, and holy, but at the same time we want to run away from it. Part of us yearns for the holy, part of us despises it. We can't live it with it, we can't live without it. We have this peekaboo relationship, therefore, with a God that we, we want to be there and we want him to do right and just, but not too close to us. A bit like that young fan of Doctor Who. Hiding behind the sofa, but riveted by the programme. And peeking round the corner of the sofa from what's deemed to be a safe distance. You wouldn't want to be without. But you don't want that too close. And here I think is why we fear the other. We fear what's different to us and certainly different in such a marked way. We are mortal. He is immortal. And death often frightens us, though we often vehemently deny it. But as fearsome as death is, it's nothing compared to meeting with a holy God. What a prospect. Now, we can all to some extent or other be subject to various phobias. They could be very serious. Fears that gnaw away at us beyond all natural reason. But there's one phobia, I think, that probably we all suffer from, although we want to deny it straight away. We, we all seem, it seems to me, as human beings, to suffer with xenophobia. What's xenophobia? Xenophobia is from the Greek word xenos, which means a foreigner, and phobia, which means being afraid of something, as you well know. We're hostile to whatever is different from us. That's the idea. <coughs> Years ago, I wouldn't have believed this unless I'd seen it myself, but years ago when I, I kept outdoor pigs on rented land when we lived back in Kent, I was amazed. The, the first time I ever mixed two breeds of pig, one which was white and one which was coloured, do you know immediately a fight broke out? Because they knew they were different. And a battle ensued. There's something inherent in created beings, it seems, which finds it hard to cope with difference. So here's the problem in, in largest part. God is just utterly different. God is the ultimate object of our xenophobia. Fear of that which is completely different from us. He's the ultimate stranger. He's the ultimate foreigner to us. He's holy and we're not. <clears throat> so we kind of relate to this one whom we fear. Letting him too close to us becomes a problem to us and we relate to him as the child relates to the scary bits of Doctor Who. Peekaboo. What's he like? Different but fascinating at a distance. Different and troubling if held too close. But we've just got to get past that if he's ever going to be of any help to us. Because fundamentally it is, according to the Bible, in his presence that there's fullness of joy. And at his right hand, right close to him, that there are pleasures forevermore. Yet human beings naturally seem to be inclined to repel the God who comes close. We don't want him too close. Human beings, you know, relate to things that alarm them 
in, in one of two ways, and, and we, we mix and match as human beings. In the animal kingdom it's slightly different. You get animals that are fight animals, like pigs on the whole, or, or maybe you get flight animals, like I guess like horses on the whole. Human beings seem to be capable of mixing and matching those two responses to perceived threat. At one point responding to that threat by fighting, at another point by fleeing. And you get this in the way that people relate to a holy God too. So we evade and avoid God. Or we try and pick a fight by trying to marshal arguments to decry or deny him. I can go on for ages with you, you know, about um, creation or evolution, uh, about the evidence for the resurrection, life after death or not, unified field theory or big bang theory, and the argument from design. I can go on for ages with you about what we've come to know as the problem of suffering or the problem of evil, as ways that people try to evade the coming close to them of a holy God. I know some people have had experiences that are hard and these are real issues and real problems and we'll continue to talk on that basis. But quite often, I wonder if talking, continuing to talk about those things is really going to help because it doesn't really get to the heart of the problem. Sometimes people have got struggles with those things but usually, usually, these seem to be elements of avoidance and evasion of the God who would otherwise come too close. Now that's the response I've described of bright people, tidy people, respectable people, as well as all the rest. Because his holiness threatens things we hold dear, and it makes him seem like a threatening foreigner. And it's the response of some really decent people in the Bible too. Isaiah, the great 8th century prophet. Peter who Jesus describes as the one who's confessed faith, and on that confession of faith he's going to build his church. But for Peter and Isaiah both, unless they could get past their fears and let God get close to them, he would never be of any help to them. And that's the problem. Can we trust him to be benevolent as well as holy and therefore allow him to get close?